Pre-launch tests of Starship 25 are continuing at Starbase. SpaceX conducted a six-engine static fire test of Ship 25 on June 26. The test saw the ignition of all six Raptor engines on the ship for about six seconds. The test was performed to verify that all the ship's engines are performing as expected and generating enough thrust. SpaceX founder Elon Musk said in a Twitter post the firing was a key milestone for the second orbital test flight. Ship 25 will eventually be paired with Super Heavy Booster 9 for the test flight. Booster 9, which is currently inside the Mega Bay, has all 33 engines installed and ready to fire. The static fire tests of Booster 9 will begin once the orbital launch pad repair and rebuild work is complete. According to Musk, more than a thousand upgrades were planned before the next Starship test flight, including a significant change to the stage separation system that will see the Starship ignite its engines while still attached to the Super Heavy. Improvements are also being made to the Raptor engines to prevent leaks of superheated gas, which resulted in multiple engine failures during the April launch. Musk estimated the launch pad, Starship, and Super Heavy could be ready to support a second launch in about six weeks, but it's currently unknown how long it will take the Federal Aviation Administration to approve a second flight. FAA officials are still investigating the events of the inaugural launch, including the failure of the automated flight termination system to immediately destroy the rocket when it tumbled out of control. You may recall that in my previous update, I discussed the hot staging technique that SpaceX would use on future launch vehicles for stage separation. The method involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage while it is still attached to its booster stage. SpaceX plans to add an interstage section on top of Super Heavy to allow the exhaust from the upper stage to escape. Although the design of the extension has yet to be revealed, one of the two ring sections recently discovered at Starbase could be a mock-up of the interstage. One of the ring sections features customized truss work with openings for the exhaust from the Starship to escape. While the design allows enough space for the exhaust to escape, the ring does not look very structurally strong with that many cutouts. The second possible interstage design spotted features 20 holes and several stringers on the exterior. The ring is clearly very rigid compared to the first design, and the holes could be ports for Starship exhaust to escape. However, the ports are so small compared to the previous design. A similar interstage was used in Titan II rockets, and you can see how the exhaust from the rocket's second stage engine escapes through the interstage ports in this NASA footage. Please be aware that SpaceX has not officially confirmed the interstage design, and that sometimes there may be a third design distinct from these two ring sections spotted at Starbase. We must wait until SpaceX installs the interstage on top of Booster 9 to confirm the design. The addition of the interstage will increase the booster's height by 2 to 3 meters. This will make it difficult for the Starship quick disconnect mechanism on the launch tower to reach the quick disconnect panel on the upper stage. SpaceX needs to extend the ship's quick disconnect upward to fit the new height. This explains why the ship quick disconnect arm was removed from the orbital launch tower in May. The ship quick disconnect was reinstalled on the tower on Friday morning, and it looks like the arm is positioned higher than it was previously located, given the increased height of the future booster prototypes. The orbital launch pad upgrade works are progressing at a fast pace. Over 130 concrete trucks were brought to the launch site on June 25, and the concrete was poured underneath the orbital launch mount over the course of 11 hours, completing the first layer of the concrete foundation. More than 1,000 cubic meters of concrete was poured under the launch mount that day, and more will be poured in the coming days to complete the foundation. When the concrete foundation is ready, the installation of water-cooled steel plates will begin. Three steel plates are designed to carry the water manifolds and supply water to the remaining plates. Those three water-carrying steel plates are being pre-assembled with the manifolds at the Sanchez site. The large center steel plate was transported to the launch site for installation on June 30. The plate will be moved under the launch mount vertically with the help of a vertical stand. From there, it will be lifted and placed under the launch mount with the help of a crane. The remaining water-cooled steel plates will be transported in the coming weeks. A huge horizontal storage tank arrived at the launch site on June 28. The tank was lifted with the help of a crane and installed near the horizontal methane storage tanks at the tank farm. The tank, designed to store liquid methane, will increase SpaceX's propellant storage capacity. After the vertical storage tanks were damaged during Starship's inaugural orbital test flight, Elon Musk revealed that the vertical tanks would be replaced by horizontal tanks in the near future. So, we can expect delivery of more horizontal tanks in the coming weeks and months. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. 
The European Space Agency's Euclid Space Telescope soared to space aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on July 1. The first stage of the rocket came back to Earth eight and a half minutes after liftoff, touching down on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. The Euclid Space Observatory separated from the rocket's upper stage about 41 minutes after liftoff and began its one-month-long journey to its halo orbit around the second Sun-Earth Lagrange point. Euclid is a visible to near-infrared space telescope developed by the European Space Agency with important contributions from NASA. The telescope is designed to better understand dark energy and dark matter by accurately measuring the acceleration of the universe. It will make a 3D map of the universe, with time as the third dimension, by observing billions of galaxies out to 10 billion light years, across more than a third of the sky. While dark energy accelerates the expansion of the universe and dark matter governs the growth of cosmic structures, scientists remain unsure about what dark energy and dark matter actually are. Euclid will show how the universe has evolved over the past 10 billion years and how the structure has developed throughout cosmic history. From this, astronomers can infer the characteristics of dark energy, dark matter, and gravity, revealing more about their precise nature. In addition, Euclid will perform near-infrared spectroscopy of hundreds of millions of galaxies and stars, allowing scientists to investigate their chemical and kinematic properties in detail. The Euclid spacecraft is approximately 4.7 meters tall and 3.7 meters in diameter and comprises a 1.2-meter diameter telescope, a visible wavelength camera, and a near-infrared spectrometer. The two-ton spacecraft will operate from the Sun-Earth Lagrange point to, at an average distance of 1.5 million kilometers beyond Earth's orbit. L2 is an equilibrium point of the Sun-Earth system that follows Earth around the Sun. It is the same location where NASA's James Webb Space Telescope operates. In its orbit at L2, Euclid's sunshield can always block the light from the Sun, Earth and Moon, while pointing its telescope towards deep space, ensuring a high level of stability for its instruments. Euclid's image quality will be at least four times sharper than that achieved by ground-based sky surveys. Following three months of checkouts and calibration, Euclid should be ready to start its operational science mission in October. The nominal mission lifetime of Euclid is six years, with the possibility of extension. Virgin Galactic launched its first commercial space flight on June 29, sending four people on a ride to the edge of space aboard a winged space plane. The mission, dubbed Galactic 01, began on Thursday morning when a giant twin fuselage mothership aircraft took off from a runway at Spaceport America in New Mexico, carrying the space plane VSS Unity. The carrier plane climbed to an altitude of about 13.5 kilometers before releasing VSS Unity, which then ignited its hybrid rocket engine to soar into space at a speed of Mach 3. One minute later, the rocket motor shut down, leaving the crew members weightless as Unity coasted up to an altitude of 85 kilometers. The spacecraft was flown by a pair of Virgin Galactic pilots and carried three paying passengers who were members of the Italian Air Force and a Virgin Galactic trainer to oversee the mission from inside the cabin. The crew was tasked with conducting 13 supervised and autonomous experiments and collecting data on their suits and sensors in the cabin. The crew only had about three minutes of weightlessness before the ship crossed the peak of its trajectory and started falling back to Earth. The space plane then entered back into the dense lower atmosphere and landed on a runway at Spaceport America, officially bringing an end to the mission. The total time between Unity's air launch and landing was just under 14 minutes. Virgin Galactic has now launched 25 people to the edge of space and is looking for future missions. The next mission, Galactic 02, is set for August, and then the company hopes to make monthly space flights after that. The inaugural launch of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket faces new delays. The first Vulcan Centaur completed a crucial engine firing in June at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, taking a big step toward its debut launch. But the vehicle will now take a step back as ULA plans to de-stack the rocket and transport the upper stage back to its factory in Alabama. The decision is based on the findings of ULA's investigation into an incident that occurred on March 29 when a Centaur exploded on a test stand at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center after experiencing a hydrogen leak. Before that anomaly, ULA had been targeting early May for the launch. The company has now determined the root cause of the anomaly, as well as the required corrective action, which explains the destacking plan. ULA said in the statement that the Centaur's thin-walled pressure-stabilized tanks need minor reinforcement at the top of the forward dome prior to flight. The company said it has several Centaur stages at its factory, one of which will be used to complete the qualification testing interrupted by the March incident. ULA did not disclose a schedule for completing that testing, modifying the Centaur, or the inaugural launch. 
The company said it will host a media teleconference in the next few weeks to provide more details. The debut Vulcan flight will launch the Peregrine lunar lander built by Astrobotic, which will attempt to deliver a batch of NASA experiments and technology demonstration payloads to the lunar surface. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.